Hi everybody, this is the next lecture and it's on chapter 59 and this is about drugs related to hypothalamic and pituitary function. This is another area that can be a little tough to kind of understand. Um, so I'll try to give you some interesting information and um, kind of put it in perspective too as, as well. Um, so let's look at the hypothalamus and pituitary. Um, it regulates a lot of the functions within our body and a lot of our hormones. Um, it essentially regulates all of our bodily processes. And there's 15 hormones and regulatory factors that are instituted through the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And they both work together in conjunction. It's kind of like the thyroid video. I don't know if you've viewed that yet, but if you have, um, that all originates from the hypothalamus and pituitary as well. So obviously, um, it's important to have a, a good understanding about a lot of this. So this next picture, um, compliments of medicallook.com. There, there is some typos in there, but honestly, I liked the picture and the way they portray it, um, so I put it on here. And it's just showing how the hypothalamus and the pituitary work together, um, you know, with the negative feedback loop. So a lot of this is all about, you know, a negative feedback loop. Um, your body senses it through the hypothalamus, then it signals to the pituitary, and the pituitary signals to, um, you know, signal these hormones to be released, and that's what is um, enacted at these target tissues. Sometimes there's organic causes that can be a defect in the synthesis of hormones, um, like it could arise from the pituitary, like a defect there, or it could even be a pituitary tumor. And there's also inorganic causes as well, and these are usually more related to like medication use. Like for instance, like if you're looking at, you know, your FSH and LH, those um, regulate the ovaries and testes. Um, so if someone's on birth control pills, you know, oral contraceptives, a lot of it has to do with like suppressing your FSH and LH so you're not ovulating. So, I mean, there's medications that obviously can influence the system as well. Same thing like with the thyroid. But the big thing I want you to understand is that, you know, you can see how much the pituitary and the um, hypothalamus affects our body, you know, and affects all these different systems. And we'll kind of run through um, each one of them, you know, a little bit and kind of go through them. So let's look at an overview um, hormones of the anterior pituitary. There's the growth hormone, there's corticotropin, thyrotropin, LH and FSH, those are for the ovaries, and prolactin, which um, stimulates uh, breast milk production. Then we also have the pituitary that's posterior, I'm sorry, the posterior pituitary, which I did put some information on Moodle, and I think it'll help clarify this a little bit. Um, the posterior pitu pituitary is responsible for oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. And those are more done through um, a nervous system response. Let me go back to this. As you can see, here's the posterior pituitary. So this is, um, these are released down axons to um, mammary glands or the uterine, because that's what oxytocin is for, for um, breast milk um, production or excretion and um, smooth muscle um, contraction in the uterus. We'll talk a little bit more about oxytocin when you cover women's health, and you also get more of that when you um, do your mer uh, maternal um, rotations as well. Antidiuretic hormone that's done through the posterior pituitary as well. So these two are kind of separated from the posterior, and then the anterior pituitary does, you know, your uh, gonadotropins, your growth hormones, your prolactin, and your ACTH and your TSH. Now notice here we have prolactin levels and we have oxytocin. This is for the expression of breast milk. This is for the production of, of breast milk. So you don't need to know all that right now, but I'm just trying to explain it to you. So let's go back to this. So I kind of went through these. Um, and like I was saying, hormone dysfunction can occur to organic causes, such as a defect in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, or even a disease of the pituitary, or a tumor in the pituitary, or a tumor in the brain that affects the hypothalamus. So anything that would affect that can, you know, ultimately affect your hormones. And then I mentioned, too, inorganic causes could be from prescribed medicines, or even non-prescribed medications, which I'll talk about in a few moments. Just another brief um, information. I worked in neurosurgery for a while as a nurse practitioner inpatient, and we did a lot of pituitary tumors, um, you know, that required certain neurosurgical intervention. So a lot of times, I mean, this is just a worst case scenario. A patient presents with galacteria, like where they have, um, they're producing breast milk when they shouldn't be, you know, there's no known cause for it. You know, they're not pregnant or, um, 
you know, they didn't just deliver or anything like that, or they're not on any medications. So it's always in the back of your mind, like, you know, they're presenting with these abnormal hormones, you know, uh, or effects from the hormones, you know, what's, what is it caused from? You know, it can be a couple of things. So like I said, it, it's not necessarily meaning that they have a pituitary tumor, but it's actually an, it's a very interesting area. Um, and I'm going to put up some more videos about it. Um, some on um, surgery for pituitary tumors, and then a patient that present, um, presents with increased growth hormone, which was from a pituitary tumor too. I just figured it keeps it a little more interesting for you, and it kind of puts that clinical picture with it, so you can kind of see how it affects all these different areas. Um, so it's just, you know, we want to keep that in the back of our mind when we're looking for differentials as to what's going on with the patient. So what we're going to talk about first is growth hormone. I'm going to try to pull out the ones um, that we see a lot in practice or that you'll see medications that are used with it. Um, so right now we're going to talk about growth hormone. You know, it has biologic effects. Obviously, we need growth hormone for normal growth and development, um, especially as um, for children. It obviously promotes growth. It promotes protein synthesis, so for your muscles. Um, and it also pr promotes carbohydrate metabolism. So you're actually utilizing, you know, the carbohydrates appropriately. And then we'll talk a little bit about the physiology of it, um, regulation of release, biologic effects, promotion of protein, protein synthesis, and then effect on carbohydrate metabolism. This I put up here, um, it, this is how um, growth hormone is released. You know, it's the same kind of thing with a ne negative feedback loop like it is with the thyroid and all the other hormones. You know, G, um, GHRH is from the hypothalamus. That's what stimulates the pituitary to release growth hormone. And the growth hormone, obviously, like I said, is needed for all those normal growth um, functions. So down here, it just kind of tells you the effects of it. So it stimulates adipose cells to break down stored fat, fueling growth effects. So that's how it does it in one form. A second form, it increases uptake of amino acids from the blood. So it, it utilizes proteins from the blood. And it's used for bone cells, muscle cells, nervous system cells, and your immune cells. So you can see the wide effect that it has on your cells and the growth of your cells. However, growth hormone, if it's in excess, it has um, a diabetogenic effect because uh, growth hormone will stimulate the liver to break down glucogen, or glycogen, sorry, <laughs> into glucose. This further fuels growth effects because it's releasing IGF-1. This is a little more than you probably need to know, but um, <laughs> this is what stimulates this even more. So if you have inhibition of growth hormone, if you're not getting enough, it's perceived by your hypothalamus. And then the G, you know, the, the release here is inhibited. And then this is inhibited further too. So it's just like it's halting that feedback loop. Um, just some other notes that maybe just to try to make it a little more interesting. In, on top of neurosurgery, I've also had a um, history of practicing in sports medicine and orthopedics. And internal med, and actually an internal med is, is when I've seen a case about this, but I just thought it was interesting and something to bring up. But, you know, people take growth hormones and steroids and all these other, you know, hormones for bodybuilding or increasing muscle mass, um, and they're really doing themselves a disservice, you know, just try to understand it, because when you think about it, it's really messing up their hypothalamic pituitary access because this is all a negative feedback loop. So if you're giving yourself artificial hormones and steroids, your body adapts to this. It's just kind of like um, giving a person um, glucocorticoids, which we'll talk about in the other lecture. You can't abruptly stop it because their body is used to not producing these now. So if someone's on artificial hormones or you know steroids, their body, it halts this process. So once they withdraw the steroids or hormones, they're, they're basically their whole um, endocrine, endocrine system goes out of whack. And it can affect literally all of this. You know, not necessarily the breast in men, but it can. Um, but it messes up their whole hypothalamic pituitary axis. So they're really, like I said, it's a really a disservice to them. Um, so they don't, you know, the, the axis does not get stimulated as normal. And then when they're done, the system's all out of sorts. So they may have any, they, they could have a ton of issues after taking um, growth hormones or um, steroids. And they actually, I've seen it in a case that when I practiced in internal medicine, I actually seen a case of it. And the problem is, is that a lot of these patients don't present until 
they have defects in all of these, you know, hormone systems. And then they come in and next thing you know, they have um, low libido and, um, you know, t uh, uh, sexual dysfunction because it actually affects other hormone systems, not just the growth hormone, but sometimes it can affect like their testosterone levels. You know, so in the end, well, some of them even take testosterone, unfortunately, too, they do that too. But, you know, a lot of these people don't know what they're doing and they're taking all these hormones and, you know, stimulating these areas and they don't realize like the ultimate effects of it after they're done. Um, so it's just, it's an important thing. I think like if you ever hear anybody about taking stuff or see it, you know, it's an important area that people should be educated on so they know the outcome of it. So I don't think a lot of these people that are taking it really realize how that it's affecting like their central hormone synthesis. So unfortunately, it just kind of ends up um, turning into an issue once they've already done damage. So, and, it, it, and it's not like it can't be corrected, but there are some um, long-term effects from it. Um, you know, or it takes a long time too for that, your body to get back to that normal regulation. So I just thought I'd mention that. So now in terms of growth hormone, this is just um, issues that, like I said, that can originate from the pituitary and all that. So deficient growth hormone is usually related to hypofunction of the pituitary. So the pituitary is not putting out enough um, stimulating factor for growth hormone. So in the pediatric population, they'll have short stature, slowed growth. Um, mental function, it's important to note their mental function is not impaired. Um, it's more related to just their growth, like their physical growth. Um, and then to treat this, it's usually done through replacement therapy. Now, if this if the onset is within an adult, these patients may notice that they have reduced muscle mass um, or weakness. So in the adult, it's a little bit different. Now, you can also have excess growth hormone where that's hyperfunction of the pituitary. And this would cause gigantism. So in the pediatric population, it usually starts early, but the, you can see it off their growth um, charts. The trends will go up. And they're a lot taller or bigger than what they should be at that, or what they, what they like the 90th percentile of the growth chart, they'll be a lot taller or bigger than that. Um, so treatment of this, sometimes they will remove the pituitary, not all of it, but sometimes we'll remove a section of it. Um, in the adult, this presents as acromegaly. And um, the video that I'll put up on there too has um, a, a patient on there um, that suffered from this. And it's just an interesting video you can watch. Um, so if the... If the uh, so if the epiphyseal plates are closed, which those are the plates that are um, at the end of long bones. So as a child grows, those epiphyseal plates are open and to um, promote continued growth. But once the growing is done, the epiphyseal plates are actually closed. So in an adult, because they are closed they get acromegaly. So they'll get enlargement of the joints. Um, and they'll actually, those joints will just, or the bones will grow. So usually this is done through treatment um, of radiation, surgery, or drugs. And, you know, I, I just want you to kind of understand or just have knowledge of it. You don't have to under, you know, remember all those drugs for that. So too little growth hormone begins before puberty. Um, and it can kind of be seen like dwarfism. Usually, though, it's recognized pretty early, so they don't, um, they typically don't have these negative outcomes, you know, during this time because it's usually recognized pretty early. Um, but like I said, if it begins after puberty in the adult, they'll have um, a reduction in their muscle mass, their bone strength, um, and they just have debilitating factors alongside with it. So now here's some um, images. So let's look at the first one where it says, says short stature with dwarfism. And like I said, a lot of times now, I mean, it doesn't get this severe because it's usually recognized pretty early. Um, and one other important thing that I wanted to mention too, um, there's achondroplasia, which is um, another form of dwarfism. And that's the most common cause of dwarfism. That's a genetic, um, a genetic disease state. And it affects the long bone formation. So there's an orthopedic factor with um, achondroplasia. It's different than this. This is basically more of a short stature related to growth, like decreased growth hormone. So it's a little bit different. All their body parts with this will be in proportion to one another. 
So the patient with achondroplasia will have um, more of defects with the long bone formation. So they will have discrepancies in bone length, where this will have um, proportionate bone length to each other. So they'll have an overall reduced um, growth rate. Now the opposite end of the spectrum, if you look over here, these were actually identical twins. This one is affected by in, um, increased growth hormone. So obviously you can know, look at how much taller your and bigger he is. And I mean, even within the extremities and the hands, you can see that the feet and the hands obviously are bigger on that side. Now in an adult, so if an adult gets this and they get it later on in life, after the, like I said, after the um, plates close, they will get um, enlargement of the actual bones too. Not just necessarily the length of them, but they'll actually get larger and wider. So growth hormone, what do we use it for? Um, we use it, obviously, we don't use it for the treatment of gigantism because that's what it would cause. We use it for pediatric growth hormone deficiency, and that's usually the most common cause that you'll see it used for. And then pediatric non-growth hormone deficient short stature. So nowadays, even if a child is smaller than average or at the very small end of the growth chart, uh, there are times where, you know, patients, parents, or the family decides that they want to discuss this with somebody that they would possibly like to institute growth hormone replacement for their child. It's a kind of a controversial thing because it's there are some negative effects from taking growth hormone as well. So, you know, you have to use it in a case where it's really, truly needed. Um, there's also a syndrome called uh, Prader-Willi syndrome, and they, it's associated with a short stature. It's used for this. Um, and also we use growth hormone for an adult that's deficient um, as well. Adverse effects, like I said, there can be some negative effects. Um, it can, the, one of the biggest one is hyperglycemia. Um, it increases blood sugar. And um, carpal tunnel, that can be just because their growth, um, the, the actual body and the joint by the wrist, that's what carpal tunnel's from, it's pressure on the nerve. And it can, have, it can cause issues with um, fatality with Prader Willi syndrome. And then it can also interact with uh, glucocorticoids. And usually that's more related to um, sugar formation. So, next, let's talk about prolactin level. So, it's produced by the anterior pituitary, just like growth hormone. This is what stimulates milk production after parturition. Its effects are hypersecretion, it has effects of hypersecretion. Um, if you have excessive secretion, um, females can have amenorrhea, galactorrhea, infertility, um, or possible delay of puberty in girls. So it's not only just um, the production of milk, but it also has an effect on their overall hormone status. So a lot of times in women that have excess storage, they will also have alongside with this, they will have you know dysfunction with their periods um, and possibilities with infertility. You know, like when a patient goes in for you know, infertility um, consultation, a lot of times they always check the prolactin levels to see if there's anything arising from, you know, the pituitary or the prolactin. So in males, we look at this and they may have a reduced libido and potency. Um, they could have galactorrhea as well, and they also could have a possible delay in puberty in boys. So treatment for hypersecretion, it's to suppress the release of prolactin. And the one that I would um, concentrate on is Parladel. Um, just kind of have a general understanding what it's used for. Um, it's bromocryptine. That's the one that's used most commonly. Now let's take a look at antidiuretic hormone. It's also known as vasopressin, and there's a few uses for it. Um, essentially what it does is it promotes renal conservation of water, so it holds on to the water. It works on the collecting ducts of the kidneys to increase the permeability to water. And this is produced in the hypothalamus. So it's a little bit different because remember I was showing you with the um, posterior pituitary. Here's another image of it actually. So the same thing, oxytocin and ADH are produced in the hypothalamus, but then it goes to the posterior pituitary. And it's where it's stored. AVP secretion, so it's secreted, the secretion is regulated by osmotic pressure in body fluids, which I'll show you in one second on the next slide. So it's kind of the same thing. It's like a negative feedback loop. There's two mechanisms that um, stimulate it. So one we look at is first is blood pressure. So it's, it senses a rise in blood pressure. This is what's inhibiting the ADH release. If the blood pressure falls, because we want to hold on to water if the blood pressure falls, it promotes ADH release. 
So that's one feedback system that kind of um, regulates this. The other one is blood osmolarity. So that's looking at like the concentration of like your sodium and potassium and all that. So rise in blood osmolarity. So like if you have more sodium versus water in your blood, it's going to stimulate antidiuretic hormone release. So that way it holds on to water. If you have a lower blood osmolarity, which is like right here, that means there'd be more water versus sodium. The kidney's going to kind of halt that a little bit. So that's kind of how these are, um, how it's regulated essentially. So blood pressure and osmolarity. So therapeutic uses for antidiuretic hormone. Um, one of the big ones is diabetes and insipidus. And I have a lot of stuff up on the Moodle book as well that will cover this. Um, the big thing is that diabetes insipidus is a completely different state than diabetes mellitus. They're not, they're not the same state at all. They're not, they're different um, pathophysiologic states. The reason why this kind of came about is diabetes, the word, was actually originated from the Greek word siphon. Um, so within both pathologic states, polyuria is present. So that's where this term came from. And that's the only reason why it's named diabetes. So both of them were named di diabetes because they both have the presence of polyuria. Um, Antidiuretic hormone can also be used in cardiac arrest. And that's mainly due to like hypovolemia. Um, and basically for perfusion, that's what that's for. And then it's also used for, um, it, it can be used for like post-op abdominal surgery if there's any bleeding because it can help constrict that. Um, and it's used for um, abdominal distension or uh, free air that's within the, within the abdomen. Um, and it's also used, another big use, um, which is one that I would look at when you're studying, is desmopressin for nocturnal enuresis, which is bedwetting in kids. Um, so the big ones are diabetes insipidus and, and um, the nocturnal enuresis, and I'll talk about those in a few minutes. And then it's also used to benefit hemophilia A and von Willebrand's disease. Both of these are um, disorders in clotting, um, and I'll, I'll cover that too, and I'll put some information up on the Moodle book about that as well. All right, so this next slide, um, I wanted to point to the management of hemophilia A. So basically... With hemophilia A, it involves injection of DDAVP, which is the desmopressin, essentially. Um, and it stimulates release of clotting factors to stop bleeding. So a lot of times it's just used for this for bleeding factors. Um, it can be used for that. And then another thing, too, that I, um, that I was talking about um, is using desmopressin for um, bedwetting. And a lot of times with kids, they actually have melt tabs or they have um, a nasal spray that they can use. And it's a real low dose, um, and they take it at night, and it's to prevent them from, you know, increasing that urination at night. So it's like a training. It's used in conjunction with, um, like, bladder training and all that. So that's one of the top uses that they use it for. And here I put this up here so you can kind of put it together with a picture um, you know, Desmomelt is the, um, is Desmopressin that they use for kids. This is an oral disintegrating, um, factor. There's a nasal spray too that can be used. However, some kids aren't the greatest with that. So a lot of times a nasal spray is more, um, is used with like a diabetes insipidus and it also comes in tablet form. So like I was saying, clinical indications, hemophilia or a clotting issue, this is where they can use, this is usually IV because it's usually in the hospital when this is occurring. Um, diabetes insipidus, it comes in different routes as well. A lot of times in the hospital, it's um, given IV. And a lot of this is brought on too by like a pituitary tr um, trauma. Um, like for instance, when I did neurosurgery, we had um, patients when they under underwent pituitary um, surgery or they had part of it removed. Sometimes that manipulation of the pituitary can put the patient into diabetes insipidus. So after they're done with surgery, it's a, it, we always look for that. And um, a lot of times there's times where we have to treat them. Um, and, you know, and we'll do IV um, desmopressin at that point in time or vasopressin. And then also, like I said, primary nocturnal enuresis, which means nighttime bedwetting. Um, and like I said, you can do intranasal or oral for that. So ADH use with diabetes insipidus. Um, so with this, they have a deficiency in antidiuretic hormone. So they'll have polydipsia, they'll have excessive thirst, and they're going to be excreting large volumes of urine, tons and tons of urine, and it'll be very dilute urine. So that's kind of the factor here with ADH um, deficiency. So like I said, treatment for the ADH defici deficiency is replacement. 
Desmopressin is the agent of choice, or vasopressin's, you know, pretty much the same thing. Adverse effects, um, because you're having them hold on to the water, you have to be careful that you're not having them hold on to too much. You know, and making sure that their electrolytes are balanced with this. You don't want in water intoxication where they then develop um, like hypo, hyponatremia or hypokalemia because they're it's so dilute. Um, and obviously, too, with this, you've got to watch with vasoconstriction because it can also cause vasoconstriction. So you got to find like a good, um, you know, the, the treatment with it. You have to make sure that you're kind of looking at all the factors here with this. I will put up more information, like I said, on um, DI and the use of ADH on the Moodle book to help you kind of understand it a little bit more. And then let's just talk about oxytocin real quick because you'll talk about this more um, within um, women's health lectures. So the same thing, produced by a hypothalamus, stored in the posterior pituitary. So this is posterior, remember, just like ADH. Um, two roles, it's promotion of uterine contractions during labor. So a lot of times this is given to stimulate labor. Um, they'll put them on oxytocin or pitocin. Um, also used after labor to um, contract the uterus, uterus so that there's not bleeding. That's what's basically... Um, it, it controls the bleeding after uh, delivery of the baby, you know, after delivery of the placenta. Also is um, involved with stimulation of milk ejection during breastfeeding. So in fact, in fact, um, breastfeeding actually will cause uterine contractions as well. So it's kind of like an inverse relationship with it too. And that will conclude this lecture on um, the hypothalamus and pituitary hormones.